There is a hardly person who has any interest in history and would not know about Richard I, nicknamed the Lion Heart. A long time ago, when I just started this channel, I thought to make a video about him, but I still stopped on William Marshall instead. But now I'm thinking about doing the video about Bertrand de Born. So I decided to do a video about Richard first, so that you can get a better understanding of Bertrand's biography. And so, now I think I can do such video. Why? Because Richard I was basically a bad son, a bad king, a bad brother, a poor commander and a horrible diplomat. This is roughly how the 14th century chronicle Thomas Subs asserted him. A bad son, a bad husband, a selfish ruler and a vicious man. Perhaps he was not a very good Englishman either, since like most all English nobility starting from William the Conqueror, he spoke French and Occitan. So we can safely call him not Lionheart, but rather Coeur de Lyon. But the English love him perhaps even more than any other English king. He is, I would say, on a par with a fictional King Arthur in popularity and fame. A large number of novels, plays and movies has been written about him. So he was much more of a knight than a king. And in this video I hope to show the true face of a knight Richard I, the Lionheart. Richard I was born in 1157 in Oxford, probably at Beaumont Castle. He was the third son out of five of Henry II, under whom England held the maximum amount of land in France, which generally backfired badly on him, leading to much strife among his sons and rebellions among the barons. We talked about him partially in the first chapter of the thorough history of the Hundred Years' War, and you can watch this video here. In this video I will talk about it too. Richard was tall, about 1 meter and 93 centimeters, blue-eyed and fair-haired and as well as very strong. Most of all, Richard loved to fight. Since childhood he showed good political and military abilities, was famous for his bravery, capable of taking the upper hand of other aristocrats on his land. However, he still did not show any great military or strategic talents. Richard attached great importance to church celebration and according to contemporaries willingly participated in the chants that accompanied the rites and even led the chores with the help of voice and gesture. However, unlike many of his colleagues of his time, he was well educated, so much so that he even wrote poetry, mostly in French or Occitan. This point of biography is unusual curious to surface later. English on the other half seems barbaric to him. Richard clashed with both his father and his brothers. Thus, initially King Henry II, Richard's father, intended to divide his kingdom among his three sons. Henry, later nicknamed the Young King, was to become King of England, and Anjou, Maine and Normandy were to fall under his control. Richard was to receive Aquitaine and the country of Poitou, his mother Fiefs. Geoffrey, on the other hand, received Brittany, through the marriage to Constance, the heiress of the province. On January 6, 1169, and in memorial together with his father and brothers Henry and Geoffrey, Richard took the homage to Louis VII, King of France, as heir to Poitou and Equity. On the same day, an agreement was reached for his marriage of Richard and Louis' daughter Adele, or Alice. This union was to seal a treaty of peace between kings of England and France. In 1170, Richard's older brother Henry was crowned as Henry III, but in 1173, Henry rebelled against his own father, Henry II. The resolvable family contradiction was that Henry II was obsessed with power and was physically unable to share even a little of it, while his children were hungry for autonomy and money. His brothers, Richard and Geoffrey, also joined the rebellion. According to the chronicler Ralph O'Cockshall, it was Henry the Young who wanted to rule independently, at least on part of the lands given to him by his father, was the instigator of the rebellion against Henry II. Sixteen years old Richard took part in the rebellion only at the urging of his mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, who had no warm feelings to his father. It was during this fair that Richard almost caught and killed his father, but he was stopped by William Marshall, and you can learn about this episode in this video. However, the rebellion was going very badly for the brothers, and realizing that the case was lost, Richard, the first of the brothers, 
came to his father in Poitiers on September 23, 1174, and begged for forgiveness. According to the treaty concluded in Falle in October of the same year, Richard retained part two, but became subject to his father. He had the right to receive a portion of the tax levies. The several castles were transferred to his possession on condition that they were not fortified, and Richard entered the fight with his brothers on the side of his father. Together with Geoffrey, Richard brought in Le Mans an homage to Henry II, and in June 1175 he went on a campaign against the barons who did not want to obey his father. In 1176 there was an episode that again shows Richard's avarice and his love of money. He received information about the dangers of a pilgrimage on the way to Santiago de Compostela. Richard urgently set out a campaign and attacked and captured the towns Dags, Boyon, and fortresses Saint Pierre at sea, where the lords who were robbing the pilgrims had settled. He abolished the tolls that had been imposed on the pilgrim. Richard disbanded his army of Brabant mercenary without even paying their wages. The mercenaries began plundering limousine. After the complaint brought to Richard by Bishop Gerard of Limoges, there was a battle of Maremo, where about 2,000 of these mercenaries were killed. Henry II gave the crown to his son Henry. However, the latter did not stay on the throne for long and died of dysentery, giving the crown back to his father. This is almost a unique case in history. After the death of Henry the Young in 1183, Richard became heir to the throne of England. However, going on crusade, he feared that his father, in his absence, would proclaim Prince John, Richard's younger brother, as his successor. Things resolved the same naturally. Henry II died in July 1189, and Richard became the king of England. However, as it turned out, the new ruler decided to use all the funds available in the treasury to prepare a military campaign to liberate Jerusalem. In general, according to contemporaries, Richard I looked at England as a source of income necessary for him to realize his ideas. Therefore, the only thing that was rapidly growing at the time in the country, the size of taxes and levies. If there was a buyer for London, I would willingly sell it, the monarch declared. However, taxes were half the trouble. It was Richard who was the first in England to come up with the idea of selling public offices. Those who were already in the bread and butter position were forced to repurchase it or lose it. Even the Bishop of Canterbury nearly went to jail for refusing to pay the king for a price of his ministry. It took three years to get through the trial. And this is by no means the only example. In 1186, his younger brother Geoffrey II died at the nice tournament. On this occasion, Henry II cancelled Justin tournaments. However, on August 22, 1194, Richard, by his decree, again allowed to hold in England knights tournaments forbidden by his father. All participants, in accordance with their position, paid a special fee to the treasury. In December of 1190, Richard, together with the German Emperor Frederick I Barbarossa, French King Philip II Augustus, Austrian Duke Leopold V went to the Third Crusade, the main purpose of which was to retake Jerusalem back. As a rule, in description of personality of Richard the Lionheart, one can find reference to his personal bravery and fearlessness. The Naumark, of course, was not a coward, but he did not have an outstanding talent as a military leader. But despite all Richard's valiant shenanigans, disdain to danger and daring, he failed to follow him through the capture of Jerusalem. The problem was that resolve and impetuous in tactic, he was confused in strategy. During the campaign he was tossed from side to side, suddenly invading Cyprus and jumping towards Ascalon in preparation for the attack on Egypt. He wandered around Jerusalem, non-stop fighting. He never decided to seize the city, not even made an attempt. In Legends of Richard uh, preserved such a romantic episode. The first time approaching Jerusalem, Lionheart threw a cloak on his face so that he could not see the holy city until he entered it in triumph. In fact, it is a perfect metaphor for his attitude. He distanced himself procrastinated and in the end simply abandoned the idea of taking the city. The story of the siege of Acre, one of the biggest military confrontations of the Third Crusade, which lasted almost two years, is also characteristic. 
Richard I did not achieve any special military successes, but quarreled with his fellow campaigners, turning them into mortal enemies. Acre fell on July 12, 1191, notwithstanding a prolonged siege. Having taken Acre, Richard could not get Saladin to fulfill the agreement on the exchange of prisoners. Tired of waiting, the English king ordered to go to the walls of a city 2,700 Muslims, who were exemplarily executed. True, the executed were men, women and children Richard did not touch, but it was after this case he was nicknamed Heart of Stone, then transformed into Lionheart. But the scare tactics did not impress Saladin, and he responded to the mass execution in the same way. As for the strategy of action, Richard constantly missed for favorable moments to strike decisive blows. Having spent time on the liberation of a coast, the king wasted his strength, exhausted his troops, and brought the army under the walls of Jerusalem, incapable of solving the main goal. At the same time, modern historians agree that Jerusalem in general almost fell into Richard's hands as an overripe fruit. Saladin's army was exhausted, his vassals were already preparing to leave the city, discipline was lame, and Saladin himself died only a few months after Richard left the Holy Land. Richard was downright obsessed with the adventure, and he saw the World Crusade as a delightful amusement park where he could compete in valor and killing Saracens. This is one of the reasons why he did not hurry to take Jerusalem, he was fine and around him in constant skirmishes with the army of Saladin. Here is what the historian Markovsky writes. During the rebuilding of Jaffa, Richard enjoyed plenty of adventurous skirmishes in the neighborhood. For example, on one occasion the king personally set out in search of forage, but rode too far away in too small troops with him. Two dozens of Saracens surrounded his warriors. Lionheart fought back violently, but time was running out. One of the knights, assessing the situation, pretended to be the king, attracted the attention of Saracens, apparently sacrificing his life, and thus gave Richard a chance to save himself. Such adventures were great fuel for ballads, but did not contribute to the purpose of a crusade. The king risked himself and jeopardized the whole campaign. Indeed, Richard's followers asked him to stop this military antics, at least until the Holy Sepulchre was liberated. But Lionheart ignored this pleas. As you can imagine, with such an approach to business, Richard quarreled with all the other rulers of Europe. Thus, he quarreled with the French King Philip II Augustus, who supported Richard's brother Prince John, who had effectively usurped power in England. The English had inflicted a terrible insult on the Austrian Duke Leopold V. At Acre, Leopold was the first to climb the castle wall and raise his flag. Richard felt that his banner had more rights and ordered Leopold's flag to be thrown down from the wall. Now we are far from it, but the warrior who first entered the wall or ramparts was always been a hero in history. Thus, in ancient Rome for this, he was even awarded a special oak, as opposed to the well-known laurel wreath. The wounded Austrian returning home gave the orders to all his vessels to capture Richard if he appeared in their land. As a result, Richard had to hastily conclude the peace treaty with Saladin, according to which Jerusalem remained under the Muslim rule, and Christians were allowed only free access for the holy sites for three years. Considering the noise and poem with which the Third Crusade began, the result was negligible, especially considering the money spent. For Richard himself, the problem was that there was no safe way to return home. He had made so many enemies, and that one way or another he had moved either through their lands or through the lands of their vessels. Richard, on his way to England, realized that he could not pass through the report thief's territory, but expected to pass incognito. Richard and his companions pretended to be pilgrims. However, unlike poor travelers, they had a lot of money. This is what drew attention to supposed pilgrims. As a result, they were exposed and taken into custody. On December 21st, 1192, the knight George Ropold captured Richard in his hiding place. Richard spent 15 months in captivity in various German cities, including Speyer, Mainz and Worms. In March 1193, he was brought to trial. The charges were serious, so he was imputed for the guilt that he insulted the banner of Duke of Austria, that he left the Holy Land to the Muslims, making peace with Sultan Saladin. 
about the fact that rich achieved the duty-free access to Christians to the holy shrines and living in Jerusalem, no one especially and did not remember. Subsequently, the crown prisoner was handed over to the Holy Rome Emperor Henry VI. A ransom of 150,000 marks was set out for Richard's release. It's about 24 tons of silver which at this time was approximately equal to two or three annual budgets of England. In addition, Lionheart had to recognize himself as a vassal of Henry VI. A new tax was announced in England, subjects have to give a quarter of their income to ransom Richard, but even his blood Latin did not allow to collect the necessary amount. As a result, King's mother, Eleanor of Aquitaine, took to the Emperor not only the money, but also a whole delegation of hostages, who were to be in captivity instead of Richard until all money will be paid. There is a puzzle legend that I really like, but which is unlikely to be historian accurate. You can riddle it out to your friends. So the story tells, when Richard was taken prisoner, it was the troubadour Blondel of Nell who took it upon himself to find Richard. He was very fond of the king, a knight and a poet with whom he had together composed and sang many songs. But how to find Richard? You can't ask around, you might get hurt yourself. It turns out that you can drive past the dungeons where your friend is and not know that he is behind the wall. So. How to find the king? You can pause here and try to decide for yourself, but the answer is rather, let's say, simple. Blondel sang his ballads on the castle's wall until he heard someone singing alone. Since the ballads were new, no one but Richard, his co-author, could know them. However, stories about Richard's terrible suffering in German captivity did not correspond to reality. And this is quite evident. If you have a hostage who cost like several budgets of England, you would try to keep him as safe as possible. So when the Lionheart reached England in March 1184, witnesses were struck, to put it mildly, to his extremely well-fed appearance. The overseers tried so hard to please Richard that he put a lot of weight, earning among his countrymen another nickname, with the easy hand of Bertrand de Born, fat as. De Born generally liked to invent nicknames for Richard, thus he nicknamed him Richard Ok Inno, yes or no, in Occitan for his indecisiveness and unscrupulousness. But we'll talk about Bertrand in a separate video. The king began hunting for those who swore an oath to his brother Prince John, and not so much for revenge, but for the sake of replenishing the treasury. Preparing for a new war, the French king Richard sold the independence to the Scottish. Literally, he recognized it for a sum slightly less than the amount set for his ransom. In this case, the hostages exchanged for Richard didn't have to buy back, the Austrian duke died, and his successor preferred to let English go free, being afraid to enter a confrontation with England. Soon the king left England, starting a war with Philip II Augustus over his possession on the continent. By January 1199, Richard managed to defend most of his land and concluded the truce with the French king. Nevertheless, Lionheart continued to punish rebellious vessels. On March 1199, he besieged the castle of Chalot, which belonged to the Count Hadhemar V of Limoges. There were only two knights among the defenders of the castles, and even those were not adequately equipped. According to the legend, the knight Pierre Basile used the frying pan instead of a shield. This amused the English, included Richard, who, believing he had nothing to fear, removed some of his armor. Basil took full advantage of this. His accurate shot from a crossbow wounded the king, causing gangrene. On April 6, 1199, Richard the Lionheart died in the arms of his mother. Historians have calculated that over ten years of his reign, King was in England no more than a half of a year. Endless military campaigns, in fact, did not bear any tangible fruit to the country. The crusade ended in failure. Almost all the funds of treasury were spent on military expenditures, as well as a ransom of the king himself. Complete lack of management skills, lack of ability in diplomacy, mediocrity in commanding troops, unjustified rigidity, squandering of funds. Richard Lundhaz was apparently bad ruler, but he was quite an outstanding knight of the time. Well, that's it for today. Hope you liked the video, like it if you do, subscribe if you want to, want to hear more. I'm going to make the next video about Betran the Born and thank you.
that's it bye bye